First of all, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And then secondly, Romans chapter 8. Those two places, 1 Peter 5 and Romans chapter 8. First Peter 5, and read verses 10 and 11. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Romans 8, verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Today I want to take up the subject, today and next week, God willing, of suffering. Now before your eyes glaze over and say, that sounds so boring, Pastor Shribe. I hope it won't be by the time I finish this morning. And I've been thinking about this more the last two or three years, I was telling some friends of mine yesterday, I've been diabetic for 43 years. I was 14 years old and was diagnosed with diabetes and I've been depending on insulin every day. Uh, Started off with two injections every day and then four injections every day after several years. Now I'm getting treated with something different so I don't need to take the shots but when you're 14 years old and you, you're in the hospital learning to test your sugar and give yourself injections, and you don't even realize this, this is going to be for the rest of your life and until some miracle comes along, and you're not thinking that far in advance when you're 14 years old. And uh, that's caused complications and vision problems. I've had a number of laser treatments and detached retina repair and cataract surgery in both eyes. And yet, thank the Lord, I'm able to read and see and drive and work. And uh, I can see how pretty all of you are, or ugly, depending on. Now, now, I do have a, I, I do have a, everyone on the internet's going to know about this, right? But I do have a cross-eyed problem because of the detached retina repair. So when I take my glasses off, I can see twice as many of you. You're sort of, there's a blur ghost image. So... When we have a small crowd, I take my glasses off. The crowd looks bigger. Three years, three and a half years ago, I discovered I had a a tumor on my kidney. I didn't have any symptoms, no pain before that. It was covering half the kidney. The doctor said that kidney's got to come out. I never had any kind of surgery on my body like that. So fortunately, we got to City of Hope, which is a major cancer research hospital, and they had a very high-tech way of operating, minimal invasion, not minimum pain, but minimum (laughs) invasion. And I recovered from that and got better and hadn't spread anywhere, but it turns out that tumor was cancerous. I thought all was well and good. And two years ago, I got diagnosed with esophageal cancer. The City of Hope told me it's a stage four. And, and they were completely unrelated. Now, I don't know if the stages are, <clears throat> um, the severity of the stages or the seriousness are different with each case of cancer, but mine, stage four, I knew that's probably not good news. And you know, the next stage is usually death. And I like to postpone that a little while if the Lord doesn't mind. And doctors told me you'd probably need chemotherapy the rest of your life recently. I should have asked, how long will that be? He couldn't tell me. And yet, because I still can go to work in between the treatments, and um, I don't feel like I'm suffering anything. And I've tried to put all this in perspective and say, well, no matter how bad my problem is, there's always somebody else whose problems are worse. So when you compare yourself to them, be thankful for the problems that you're not dealing with and be thankful for problems you don't have. Um, And so you have really no reason to complain. You know, somebody else would say, hey, you want to complain? Let me tell you about my story. But so I want to take up the subject of suffering. 
And uh, there's a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and a lot of tragedy in the world. And nobody is immune to it. Right now, some of you are young and healthy, and your lives are pretty simple. Your mom and dad are paying the bills for everything you enjoy. There's plenty of food uh, to eat, plenty of clothes to wear, and there aren't many issues you need to be concerned with. But if you live long enough, and in one sense, I hope that you do, you'll discover that pain and heartache and disappointment are a part of life. They're inescapable. And uh, the reason I say I hope you do is because I want you to learn to trust God when those times come. So how do we um, face times of suffering without losing uh, hope? There are many authors who have tried to take up this question, both saved and not saved. And we run through some of the titles, When God Doesn't Make Sense, by Dr. James Dobson. <clears throat> Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, by Timothy Keller. The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. Suffering and the Sovereignty of God by John Piper. Making Sense Out of Suffering by a, a philosophy professor, uh, Peter Kreeft of Boston College. When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold Kushner. That was a bestseller years ago. Why Suffering by Ravi Zacharias. A Grief Observed, also by C.S. Lewis. Where is God? When It Hurts by Philip Yancey, A Path Through Suffering by Elizabeth Elliot, and many others. And the things I say probably aren't going to be original. Others have said them before me, and I, I hope others will say them after me. <clears throat> but suffering comes in a multitude of ways. Think of crime and violence and uh, disease and imprisonment, sometimes false imprisonment, physical handicaps, Sick children, war and death, starvation, torture. Someone deceived you, someone cheated you, someone who you thought was your friend betrayed you. Uh, someone you loved suddenly died. And your heart is broken. So what should be the Christian's relationship to God in times of suffering? Well, the atheist's position is that the fact that there is suffering proves there is no God. Their argument goes like this. You Christians believe in a, say you believe in a God who's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's all-loving. And the Christian would agree to that. Well then, how do you explain so much suffering in the world? War and famine and torture and starvation and children with diseases? If a tragedy happens somewhere and your God is unaware of it, then he's not all-knowing, is he? If he's aware of it, but he can't do anything about it, then he's not all-powerful. If he's aware of it, and he can do something about it, but he decides not to, then he's not all-loving. And they think that a riddle like that disproves the very existence of God. Buddhists claim the Buddha taught suffering comes through desire, having too much attachment to things in this life. So if um, you want or desire nothing, you're not attached to any f object or any possessions in this life, then you're not disappointed if you don't get them. You're not disappointed if you don't have them. And therefore, you rise above suffering. But someone could argue, didn't the Apostle Paul say, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, Philippians 4.11. Yes, he did say that. <clears throat> but there's a marked difference between accepting things you can't do anything about and deciding I'm not going to do anything about it. That's the Buddhist idea. Just accept it and que sera sera, as Doris Day used to sing. <clears throat> Some of you don't remember who Doris Day was. That's okay. Um, but if you break your arm... Wouldn't you desire medical help? Wouldn't you want a doctor to come to your aid? Sure you would. That's well, stupid philosophy. So I don't want anything. I don't desire anything. Um, if your car breaks down, wouldn't, was it wrong to desire a better car? Um, it's been said there are two things you should never worry about. The things you can change and the things you can't change. 
If I can change my circumstances, there's no need to worry. If I can't change my circumstances, there's no point in worrying. Those two options encompass almost every circumstance in life. But uh, the atheists and the Buddhists want to pre pretend that all of life's misery and suffering and pain are caused by outside influences that they have no control over. They can't do anything about. Buddhism, which calls itself an atheistic religion, they don't believe in one supreme God overseeing the universe. They say that if you're suffering, if you have pain, if you have some very difficult circumstance that's just bearing down on you, it's because that in a previous life, you caused harm and pain to someone else, and now payback is finally caught up with you. This is called good karma, bad karma. You're going to get what you uh, have put out. Just exactly how the laws of good karma and bad karma and retribution operate without some intelligent god overseeing it is a mystery. The atheists just want to complain. They want to blame all of life's problems, all of life's disappointments, warfare, violence, bloodshed, everything else, on the very idea of God, specifically the God of the Bible. That's the one they really despise the most. That's because he's the only real God there is anyway. <laughs> but you can't find character flaws in someone that doesn't exist. This is their problem. They try to find a character flaw in someone that's not there. The problem is up here with them. And uh, the American president, Calvin Coolidge, told a group of Boy Scouts back in 1925, it's hard to see how a great man can be an atheist without the sustaining influence of faith in a divine power we would have little faith in ourselves. Doubters do not achieve. Skeptics do not contribute. Cynics do not create. Atheists like to write pamphlets. They like to engage in public debates, but they don't do anything. Where are the atheist hospitals? Where are the atheist universities? Where are the atheist orphanages in third world countries? They don't exist. They just love to complain. If God stepped in every time some tragedy would happen or every time someone was about to hurt someone else and he stopped it from happening, then people would ask, well, why doesn't God back off a little bit? Let us learn from our own mistakes, trial and error over time. Give us some space here. So because God doesn't step in, they say, your God's not a loving God. You see, God can't win with some people. And that's the case of the atheist. Uh, so much suffering and trouble in the world is caused because man has a free will. This is the problem. Everything is somebody else's fault. Remember I mentioned a few weeks ago, if something good happens to me, oh, sure, I did it. I, it's, I deserve it. If something bad happens to me, it's his fault, her fault, my, the company's fault. There's some systematic you know, discrimination against my group. But uh, God created the heaven and the earth and the seas, and God saw that it was good, Genesis 1.10. He created the grass, the herbs of the field, and the trees, and it was good, verse 12. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and it was good, verse 18. Every creature in the ocean and the birds in the, in the air, and it was good, Genesis 1.21. Every land animal, and it was good, verse 25. And then God gave man dominion over all of it. Genesis 1, verse 28. And man's very first significant act was to rebel against God and sin against the one rule God had given him. Thou shalt not, of the, but of the trees, of the fruit of the trees of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 17. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned, Romans 5, 8, or 5, 12, excuse me. <clears throat> Everyone suffers because of Adam's free will. Adam's free will led him astray. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. The weakness of his flesh became the weakness of your flesh. It's like something genetic is passed from one generation to the next. Now, admittedly, some people sin more than other people do. Some people have something in them, they, they try harder 
not to give offense, not to hurt someone else, not to be dishonest, if at all possible, not to steal and lie to other people. They, they have some conscience that this is how a person is supposed to live. And boy, I wish I knew more people like that. <clears throat> but the amount of sin is not as important as the fact of sin. And sin uh, is man's fault. <clears throat> you suffer because, number one, you have a free will and you have chosen foolishly. You've made some dumb, stupid decisions in your life. You didn't think smoking two packs of cigarettes a day would give you emphysema, lung cancer, throat cancer, mouth cancer. Even though you got 10 million examples of people who died from cigarette smoking uh, related diseases before you to set as a, a, serve a lesson, serve as an example, and you were too stupid to learn from their bad decisions, you thought you would be the exception. Same thing applies to drinking alcohol, uh, drug use, perversion, you're some sex pervert, some fiend. Now you're, you're wondering, how did I catch VD and AIDS? Because you're sick. Something wrong with you. You Secondly, you suffer because not only do you have a free will, but the next guy has a free will too. Sometimes his bad decisions intrude into your life. I'm mean, giving a dramatic example, but think of some guy as a drunk driver. Gets behind the wheel under the influence. He thought he could control the car. Ends up hitting somebody on the sidewalk. Ends up killing some family on the freeway. We hear those stories all the time. The guy doesn't even realize he did it. He's so inebriated and his nerves are so loose, he didn't even feel any pain on the impact. Thirdly, you suffer because your, your parents, and your grandparents, and your ancestors, going all the way back to Adam, all of them had free will as well. You've inherited their traits in a number of ways. And fourthly, I could say you suffer because God put a curse on the earth, on the ground of the earth, because of Adam's sin. In a sense, we could blame it all on Adam. And boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to that guy, right? We can have some words. <clears throat> but from the moment you're born, you're on a, a slow journey to death. And everything you eat comes from the ground, ultimately. God put a curse on it. I mean, the fruits and vegetables, they look good, they smell good, they taste good. But if left to themselves, they're also in the process of decaying. You know, the word humus, I've said this before, the word humus, H-U-M-U-S, means the, like the soggy leaves on your flower bed. They start, when they get wet and soggy, they're rot, they start to rot, deteriorate. That's what humus is. And that's where we get the word human being. You're slowly decaying. You're slowly deteriorating. It's not very complimentary, is it? But so you're dying, but you can only sustain yourself by eating other things that are dying. That's a bad predicament to be in. And all of this was because Adam's free will and his decision to rebel against God. But just as you have a free will to do evil, you also have a free will to do good. And how you handle problems, how you react and respond to problems in life will make all the difference. So I call this sermon, and we're finally getting to it, uh, the blessings, or rather, the benefits of suffering. The benefits of suffering. I'm going to give you three benefits that can come from suffering today. We'll move on to the rest of my outline next week. Next week, I hope to give you eight, nine, ten more benefits that can come through suffering. But first of all, if you endure suffering, you win victory in the unseen world. I want you to go back to the book of Job. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And notice there verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And then Satan told the Lord, verse 11, But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So God let Satan take everything from Job, destroyed his property, his cattle, his servants, and uh, 
uh, slew all ten of his children. The Bible says, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly, down in verse 22. Then Satan struck Job with sore boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, the Bible says. And the Bible says, In all this did not Job sin with his lips, chapter 2, verse 10. God knew there was something about the character of Job. And he knew that Job could be afflicted and lose everything and still not lose his faith in God. And thus winning victory over Satan's challenge to God. Winning victory in the unseen world. In the invisible world, between heaven and hell, between God and the devil, that's where all the real action is taking place. You just don't see it. You're not aware of it all the time, but that's where the real battle is taking place. And uh, if your life is good and healthy and happy and you have just about everything a person normally wants in life, and suddenly some tragedy comes to you, some thing afflicts you or your family member or somebody you love and care about, you might think God has forgotten about you. But let me suggest to you, all of those things might be proof that God hasn't forgotten about you. He knows what you're made of. He knows what you're capable of. And the way you respond to tragedy uh, by trusting God causes to win an unseen vic or wic or rather a victory in the unseen world. The second benefit I'll call to your attention is this. Suffering expands your view of God. Turn over to Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. And look at there, look there at verses 1 through 4. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he, that's man, cannot answer him one of a thousand. He, God, is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. You know, a being like the Lord God cannot be debated with. Someone who could create not just the sun, but all of known reality, can do whatever he wants to do with his creation. Who are you and I to tell him, you did it wrong, you did it right, you should do it this way, God? God asked Job later in chapter 40, verse 2, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. There in Isaiah 55, verse 8. Let me ask you a question. What's more important in the life of a Christian? To understand the reasons why everything happens or to give glory to God when things happen? All right. God might know more about your problem than you know. We tend to think, well, certainly if God knew as much about my problem as I have, he'd handle it a whole lot differently, right? Because we get impatient with God. But he knows more about you than you know about you. He knows more about your problems than you could possibly know. And he knows how it can bring ultimate glory to him, even if you can't see it right now. Paul asked 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Nobody. Then Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean you know everything God knows, but it means you ought to think like God thinks. And through suffering, it expands your view of God. He's much greater than you are. Thirdly, a third benefit that can come from suffering is it keeps you humble. Keeps you humble. Look at Job 42. Job 42 in verses 1 through 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that, or that which, I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Suffering and pain and misery can humble you like nothing else can. Uh, it not only expands your view of God, but it, it diminishes your view of yourself. 
That's a problem with the world. People think too highly of themselves. I'm all that. Look at me, right? But through trial, hardship, pain, and suffering, you begin to see how great God is and how small and insignificant and powerless you are in, by contrast. That's as it should be. People generally reject somebody who lacks humility. I had a friend years ago, a Christian pastor friend of mine, and he used to joke. Actually, he's the guy that uh, introduced me to Dr. Ruckman's ministry. But he used to joke and say, I'm going to write a book one day called Humility and How I Attained It. <laughs> but um, when you're going through trial and tragedy, sickness perhaps, and you're overwhelmed with depression, uh, it's hard to think how God could, uh, how great you are. It's hard to dwell on yourself. Look at me, how awesome I am, how powerful I am, how great I am. Look at my achievements, my accomplishments. And they could all be taken away like that. They can all disappear that quickly. You start off to think more about others and other things, other people, than you do yourself. And that's as it should be. Now, lastly, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is a real relevant text to this subject. 2 Corinthians 12, and let's begin at verse 7. Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that, I might, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The Apostle Paul had been given more revelation than any other man. And he said, this thorn in the flesh that afflicted him was sent by God to keep him humble. Verse 7, he called it the messenger of Satan, sent to buffet me. That's like the spiritual contest I mentioned in point number one. You're winning a victory in the spiritual world. And he said through it, he would know the grace and the strength of God, verse 9, and the power of Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. It doesn't mean you go out looking for it. Don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean you go out looking to get sick, looking to have a car accident and be injured, looking to have some major problem come to you. But you face it with the mind of Christ. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Um, just as James said, my brethren, count on all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience, James 1, verses 2 and 3. It's generally agreed that Paul's thorn in the flesh was poor eyesight. The Bible doesn't specify, but he told the Galatians, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, Galatians 6, 11. Well, the book of Galatians isn't a long letter like Romans, or 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, or even Hebrews. So he must mean uh, his handwriting was large when he wrote to them. He told them earlier in Galatians 4, 15, For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them unto me. And then he concluded by uh, being that being kept humble and glorifying God was more important in understanding why he had this problem. Right, it was more important than getting what he wanted from God, getting what he asked God for. Peter wrote, but, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. First Peter 3 verse 14. 
And he repeats it almost verbatim in chapter 4, verse 14. Then he says in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. I'm going to begin to bring this to a close. I've only mentioned three benefits that can come through suffering. To win victory in the unseen world, to expand your view of God, and to keep you humble. And I hope to expand continue this next week and add about 10 more benefits that can come through suffering. But before we finish, the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby was blinded by a careless doctor when she was only six weeks old. So she doesn't remember having seen anything. And she lived to be 95 years old. And over the course of a 51 year um, career, she wrote over 8,000 songs and poems and Christian hymns. And try what probably one of the most prolific hymn writers in all of church history. And the doctor who caused her blindness never forgave himself. When she was asked if she harbored any ill will toward that doctor, she would say this, <clears throat> if I could meet him now, I would say, thank you, thank you, over and over again for making me blind. I could not have written thousands of hymns if I had been hindered by the distractions of seeing all the interesting and beautiful objects that would have been presented to my notice. We complain because we have a headache. We complain because we have some minor problem. We sang three of her hymns earlier when we got started. Over 8,000 songs, hymns. I'm told that there's one publishing company that still has a collection of all of her um, poems that have never been set to music, waiting for someone worthy to perhaps get control of them and put them all to music one day. You know, when someone writes a song that blesses our hearts, like she did, John Wesley and others, then it's, it's sort of like God saying of Abel, he being dead, yet speaketh. Dr. Ruckman wrote well over 100 books, commentaries on the entire Bible, church histories, and theological studies. And he being dead, yet speaketh. Jack Chick wrote, what, two, three hundred different tracts? But he being dead, yet speaketh. Undoubtedly, that's what Paul meant when he said, When I am weak, then am I strong. God uses you in marvelous ways through pain and suffering, if you just let him. If you just seek him to do it. And say, God, I don't understand this, but I want you to use me in some way to be a blessing to others through it. All right? 